Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. We have an update with Millennial Precious Metals. Uh, for anyone that's new to the story, I recommend that you watch some of the previous webinars that you can find on our YouTube channel that go through the full story. This is really going to be a corporate update talking about the recently uh, closed financing, as well as ongoing drill programs. As always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements, and there will be a Q&A section, so feel free to input your Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Green. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce CEO Jason Kosek. Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me on, Deb. And Deb, and thanks for everyone for, for joining today. Much appreciated. Yeah, it's been a busy time. I think you've got some drill results to talk to us about, as well as uh, talk to us about use of proceeds and, and what you've got planned for the next couple months. Yeah, exactly. I'll run you through, uh, like, like you mentioned, if anyone wants a more detailed breakdown of Millennial as a whole, uh, you can book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me on on our company website, or as Deb mentioned, listen to the to the previous uh, presentations. But today we'll just focus, as you mentioned, Deb, on the financing, what's coming next in the pipeline from from the drill bit, then run you through some of the the previous drill results that we've we've put out. Great, awesome. Well, as Deb mentioned, we'll be making some forward-looking statements, so the full disclaimer is on the company's website. As everyone knows or may not know, we just closed on a $16.1 million financing. We went up on $15 million. It was completely oversubscribed. Uh, it was pretty much everyone playing uh, pro rata on the, on the financing with lead orders from Franklin Templeton, uh, Dalbrook, uh, Merck, and Crestcat that has now uh, increased a significant position. As you can see now, unlike most companies in our sector, we're 65% institutionally held and two or three high net worth individuals compose that. Uh, everyone in the management team played in the financing and show supports at these levels. So very tight float, uh, very small retail component at 16.5%. The cash balance is just over $17 million. I, as I mentioned, we raised $16 million. We just made a $3.2 million payment to Waterton and had to pay the bankers and lawyers on, on, on the financing. Currently, now we have 178 uh, million shares out. 214 fully diluted. Research reports from Stifo PI, ACAP on Cormark. If anyone is interested in reading them, feel free to reach out to myself or, or Deb and we can send them your way. But what they're really modeling is something that can do 125,000 ounces per annum for you know nine to 13 years, all in sustaining costs under 1,000. CapEx numbers is between 130 and 180. Uh, so quite robust numbers. Um, a good analogy to, to this project would be the Gold Standards Ventures project that was just bought by Orla for $235 million. Right now, uh, we just had our second rig show up. We have a big investor tour starting tomorrow on our Wildcat project. Just in, in summary for the Wildcat project, I'm not going to get into the technical details of low sulfidation epithermals for the essence of time, but if anyone wants to, to, to dive into the details, as I would love to do, uh, we can uh, do that uh, offline and you can book a meeting with me one-on-one. -on -one. Right now, the current resource is a pit-constrained resource. We run the pit shell at $1,500 gold. We use $2 ton mining for processing to GNA. Right now, we're sitting at 776,000 ounces and basically no strip, which plays a huge uh, parameter in, into the economics. These are high quality, high margin ounces, and the grade sits at 0.4. It should be noted for everyone out there for open pit heap leach projects in Nevada, the average grade for the Great Basin is 0.38. Okay. The program is underway. We have five holes complete three in the lab. So we should see uh, uh, news flow coming in the next kind of couple of weeks here. What the program was designed to do was to do the geotech. So see how steep we can make the pit walls, see what the, the, the recovery is in the network, both on the oxides and the transition zone, see what the resource conversion rate is from inferred into indicated and see if we can open it up in any direction. The program was 20 holes, just shy of 3,000 meters. It's ongoing with, with two rigs. It should be noted, though, that uh, just so everyone knows, in Nevada, there's two types of permits, okay? There's a 
an NOI permit, which gives you five acres of disturbance, and then a plan of operations, but basically you can permit almost as much as disturbance as you want. These projects, Mountain View, Wildcat, Red Canyon, all of them have never had a plan of operations permit on them. So what does that mean? Is that for Wildcat, for example, we're looking at only drilling on five acres of 17,000 acres. So we are just scratching the surface with this current resource. We see a lot of resource growth potential within that current five acres. You know, right here is the current pit shell that I'm highlighting uh, in red. There is beautiful high grade blocks right at surface. What does that mean? It really helps for, for the payability and the payback period. Again, on a long section, this is the pit shell. None of these high-grade blocks that sit below are in the current resource. That is a relic of drill spacing uh, and a lack of understanding on the transition zone uh, on the leachability. But as a whole, what we see right now from our detailed mapping program is the mineralized horizon exists for 2.3 kilometers by 1.2 kilometers by about 100, 150 meters thick. Um, if we're doing back of the envelope calculations and you use 2.5 for, for density, you know, not all of that's going to be mineralized, say 20 to 30 percent conservatively. You're looking at over 200 million tons just in this small footprint. Um, right now, the current resource is at 61 million tons. So the growth potential on a brownfield scale is, is, is very significant. I'm not going to get into the schematic model of these systems. But what we're looking at is just really scratching the surface. So what does that mean is that the whole system is still preserved. So the high grade material is still sitting below the system. Basically, think about these as a mushroom. The fluid migrates up these stems, hits a more permeable horizon. You supersaturate a volcanic rock that has great porosity and permeability. You remove lithostatic pressure. You create flash boiling and the gold to precipitate out. Uh, whereas the high grade zones, they're, they're caught up in, in fractures and in breccias uh, and, in, and in veins. So the growth potential both uh, along strike within the volcanic horizons, but also at depth uh, is, is significant. Um, as I mentioned, we've significantly increased our land position by over 87%. Um, right now we're doing all the optimization work for the upcoming PEA, which will be due in the fourth quarter. Uh, the team has done a great job optimizing it. Uh, we are looking, you know, the current pit is basically what I just highlighted. We're looking at hauling ore down to into, into this valley where the power, where the road is, where we have water access versus down to this valley. In the north, East Valley saves us about $40 million in, in, in operating CapEx over the life of mine. Uh, Mountain View, just for a refresher, again, $1,500 pit shell, $2 ton mining $4 done processing to GNA. You're currently sitting at 427,000 ounces. The grade is significantly higher at 0.57. The key takeaways that we realized about this program is the feeder zone that no one has ever drilled has been identified. And this is what I'm talking about, the stem of the mushroom. You're looking at almost a meter of 141 grams. The grade continuity here is spectacular, you know, 128 meters of 1.73. Uh, as I mentioned, for oxide projects, the average grade is 0.38, so orders of magnitude higher. We see a lot of deep intercepts with a lot of oxidation. We're currently doing five columns, tests, 40 bottle rolls to really get a strong handle on the metallurgy and, and, and the leachability for the PEA. Uh, our last hole that we put out was probably our best hole in these markets. They don't get recognized, but when you're talking about 185 meters of 1.48 gram per ton oxide material, you know, then that's probably one of the best holes we've drilled to date. And the best part about it is, is as we get deeper and as we go to the Northwest, we see a significant shift in the amount of brecciation and the different types of alteration. We see this shift from kaolinite to illite. And what that really represents is a shift in the temperature of the fluid. And as you're getting hotter, you're getting closer to the boiling zone, closer to the bonanza, the higher grade zone. And what we did is it, we did a hundred meter step out outside of the pit. And just so you know, when you're doing holes, you know, 37 meters of pretty much four grams, 
one hole in this type of deposit can add a hundred thousand ounces. Okay. So that's why we love these projects. These low solvidation epithermals is that they are low capex, unlike um, orogenic systems or sulfide systems. And the cost per discoverable ounce is extremely low. So investors see less dilution in these types of projects. Okay. Um, we don't need to talk about the kinematic model. Um, we can go into greater detail, but again, very similar to, to Wildcat. Fluid migrates up the fault systems, up fractures, hits a more permeable horizon, precipitates the gold out. And these bonanza zones that you know host the 141 grams are right underneath these oxide pits. Um, again, significantly increase the, the land position by over 80% to secure access to roads, power, and water. Um, I'm not going to get into Red Canyon, but I just want to identify one thing, uh, and this is one of the reasons why Crestcat got involved, is hole two, which was the second hole we drilled as, as a company, was 54 meters of four and a half grams. That is the top 1% of gold intercepts drilled in 2021. The other three were in the top 10% of gold intercepts drilled in 2021. And these are oxide ounces, okay? So the most highest quality ounces. And this sits in the most productive horizon in, in Nevada. And it sits 35 kilometers south of the Cortez complex. This is something that people really don't understand in, in our portfolio. This is something that you get for, for free. All the value is strapped to Wildcat and Mountain View. But Red Canyon can be a significant game changer and could be something truly world class. Right now, uh, I'd like to just identify one thing. There's been a lot of M&A in Nevada. And recently, um, Orla just bought purchase Gold Standard Ventures um, for, I believe, $235 million. Gold Standard Ventures is pretty, our, our best comparable. Um, they sit right here. They have 1.3 million ounces. We have 1.2 and growing. What people don't understand and what you need to do to compare apples to apples is you need to factor in the grade divided by the strip ratio. What is the strip ratio? It's your waste to ore ratio. So how much waste rock do you have to move, remove to get to your ore? And when you do that, Millennial has the highest effective open pit oxide project in the best mining jurisdiction in the world. You know, and you when you go down this list, Hasbrook is 50% owned by Sun Valley, and they don't want to do anything with it until gold's $3,000. Northern Bullfrog has been taken out. Gold Rock is taken out. Pan got taken out by Caliber. Florida Canyon is owned by Argonaut. Round Mountain is Kinross. Those are big companies. Mother Load is gone. GSV is gone. All of these transactions have been taken out between 0.75 and 0.8 times the consensus net asset value. Right now, we are trading at 0.15 on a PNAV basis. So there is a significant re-rating opportunity uh, once we publish our PEA. And that's what we really need to do this year. And that'll be the main value driver. People might ask how you make money at uh, 0 0.45, 0 0.42. Reality is, is that $1,600 gold, you have a $22 in situ value, the average operating cost is $11. You have a 50% margin. Apple doesn't make a 50% margin. These are the highest margin, highest quality ounces you can get in the best mine jurisdiction in the world. And lastly, um, the average acquisition cost for global ounces is $90 an ounce. For oxide ounces, which we all have all oxide right now, they are around $120. So Caliber bought Pan for $95. Sentara bought Gem Fields for $130. Orla bought GSV for Oxide Ounces for $125. So there's a significant you know, re-rating opportunity to trade in line with our peer groups after the updated resource and the PEA. And there is a severe scarcity of these assets in Nevada. And we are the last man standing. And I truly like being the last man standing. And uh, it's going to be an exciting year to come. Quickly, you know, one thing that our company tr truly believes in is, is we believe in systematic 
scientific but aggressive exploration. And since being, you know, we went public in May of 2021. Since then, we've acquired eight projects. We've gone public on two exchanges. We've drilled three projects, almost 20,000 meters, raised over $45 million. We'll have an updated resource in the third quarter and a PEA in the fourth quarter. And I beg to differ, there's another company out there who's been that aggressive in the last year to 18 months. Um, with that, um, I'll open the floor up for, for questions. I'm sure, Deb, you have, you have a few. Sure. Well, let's start with the financing that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, does this change how aggressively you're going to explore this year? Has it altered your, your drill plans at all? No, it really just allowed us, uh, allowed us to execute the drill program and, and have a lot of cash left once we publish the, the PEA. And the big thing is, is why companies don't re-rate commonly off the back of a PEA is because they use it as a financing mechanism. So there's a financing overhang once they put out the PEA. So people don't buy into it because they'll buy the financing. Um, and, um, and really, we needed to have enough cash in the bank to, to, to pay that, that milestone payment. So it doesn't change, change the program uh, at all. It just allows us to have, have, have more cash in the bank uh, going into, into, the, into the summer doldrums here. Well, that makes sense to me. The other question I had was just about the type of drilling that you're doing at both Mountain View and Wildcat. Are you doing RC or diamond drilling right now? So we're doing all core. Um, the reason why we're doing core is primarily um, the historical companies who have drilled this used RC, and they had a very poor understanding of the kinematic controls to the mineralization. Uh, it's very hard to log alteration in structures out of chips. So we elected to, to drill everything with core so that we can have a robust geological model that will support the grade model. So doing alteration lithology structure that complements your, 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 your grade and your block model. If you don't do that, uh, your resource, it won't hold together. The other reason why we elected to do core is so we have enough material for, for the column tests. You need um, core to do the column tests the viability test, which is the most accurate form for, 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 for heat bleach projects. And lastly, for the PEA as well, we needed HQ and PQ core to, to design uh, the, 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 the pit walls. So none of that had ever been done. And we're lucky that we, we use core because now we have a fundamental understanding of, of what's controlling the mineralization primarily uh, at, at Mountain View. Um, and it allows us to fast track everything and, and build off of it uh, to produce the PEA. Can you use the historic RC um, drill results in your updated resources? Yeah, so they're already, they were used in the, in the resource that we put out when we went public. We can validate it through the pulps or the rejects. We have all the lab certs. So that's all been third party verified uh, and published in the in the previous 43101. So we can use uh, a, a lot of that. The big thing was was um, for these programs was getting the conversion from inferred into indicated to feed the PEA and to do the met work and the geotech work. Can you speak a little bit to the split between infill and uh, step out drilling that you've been doing? It's pretty much 90% infill. Uh, and the reason why is that we need indicated for really for the for the for the PEA because you're asking a geologist to say from this hole up to 100 meters away to this hole to predict what's what's in between, and and really to have a robust PEA you need to see what that conversion rate is, and you have to remember when we inherited when we purchased these projects, you know we already had 4.75 acres of disturbance. So we were, we were really confined of, of to where we could step out. At Mountain View, we did two step out holes, both you know increased the, the pitch shell. We added almost 230 meters of strike to the Northwest. Uh, Wildcat, we have two, two step out holes, um, but the big exploration program will come in 2023 once we have the plan of operations permit and then we can start drilling off 
off everything on a brownfield scale. And I think that's the real, <clears throat> not only does the PEA drive the value, but next year when we have the plan of operations, you'll see significant resource growth, basically because anyone who's ever drilled this is just drilled on that five acre postage stamp. Got it. Okay. And then in terms of depth, you have been drilling deeper, I believe, at Mountain View and Wildcat. Can you talk a little bit about how the depths compare to the existing resource pit shells? So at, at Wildcat, we're keeping it pretty tight. There's We're doing a 200 meter spaced deeper holes like the, this guy down here. This is the current pit shell, like I, like I mentioned. So we will send a few holes down on a, on a basically 200 meter spacings to, 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 to test that plumbing system. But we need to expedite the process to, to, to finish this drill program, to get all the material to the lab to do the met work, uh, which takes quite a bit of time to get the PE out, PEA out in the fourth quarter. Um, at Mountain View, we drilled a few deep holes, you know, hole 24 being one of the deepest. Uh, and it it basically ended in, in, in mineralization. Hole 25 actually stepped out another 100 meters, uh, and we lost it right when we got into this into this breccia. But we really wanted to understand the controls before we start drilling, you know, 500, 700 meter holes. Okay. And I think you have a slide with your different assets. Would you mind pulling that up? It was hard to see the scale. So one of my questions is, what is the distance between Wildcat and Mountain View? So it's about a 45 minute drive. It's uh, 58 kilometers, I believe. So the PEA, what it'll be is each project will have its own pits, pads, and ponds. And then you'll truck the loaded carbon from Mountain View to, to Wildcat uh, to a centralized uh, ARD stripping facility. So it saves about $25 million in your CapEx and saves significantly significantly on your, on your GNA. Dune and Eden are right beside each other. Mar and Oslo are right beside each other. And, and Red Canyon is literally right beside Gold Bar, uh, which is McEwen Mining and 35 kilometers south of, of Cortez. Uh, and then you have I-80 down here. Okay, well, sounds like you're in a great neighborhood. I had one audience question, which was, are you planning on drilling Red Canyon? I saw Crescat say it will be a great asset once it's drilled out. Can you talk a little bit about your plans there? Yeah, so right now the team is redoing all of the geophysics, relogging uh, all the all the core, uh, putting together a structural and kinematic model towards it. It'll be good once we have our verify model up. Um, there's a another target a kilometer and a half away, and that would be a significant step out. Basically, we're doing all the, the systematic scientific work behind the scenes right now with the hopes of drilling it possibly in, 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 the, in the fall. The reality is, is that it'll be a drill intensive project. So drilling it and raising money for it right now when we're trading at 0.18 nav uh, is extremely dilutive to our shareholders. Got it. Okay. Well, that's all I have for questions for myself, and I don't see any other audience questions. So maybe just two more things, Jason. What are you most excited about right now? Uh, honestly, the uh, what's what's getting me very excited is the, the first couple of column tests that got back from from Mountain View were much better than expected, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and we are just literally, I, I'm, I'm here down in, in, in Reno, uh, and I just saw the, the first couple of samples come up from Wildcat, and it looks, uh, looks very, very interesting. Uh, so really, what's, what's really driving me this year is, is wrapping this, these two projects up with a, with a wonderful PEA that will really show, show the economics. And as I mentioned, Deb, you know, when you have, now you have Richard Wark with Augusta, trying to wrap up Nevada. You have Pierre Lassonde now in Nevada. You have I-80, you have Caliber. People want nav exposure to, to Nevada. And when you look at the average acquisition costs on a consensus PNAV level, you're, the average on a PNAV level is 0.75 to 0.8, and we're trading at 0 0.15, 0 0.18. So you know, once we put that PEA out, uh, we'll be able to trade in line with with our peer group. So, you know, really the, the drilling and, and really the upcoming PEA 
Mm-hmm. Well, I think you did a good job of outlining the value proposition in a variety of different ways. Definitely, you know, very cheap, very interesting, lots of catalysts. You listed a lot of the major catalysts that the market can expect this year. In terms of like cadence of drill results, what, what do you expect? How often do you think you'll be putting out results? I, I try them every four to six weeks. It just depends on, on the, the speed of drilling. Our, our lab guarantees us three-week turnaround time. Um, but once you get into the actual mineralized zones at both Mountain View and Wildcat, the drilling production decreases significantly because the rock is so broken up and so altered, which is great from an economics perspective. But but uh, production from 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 the drill bit slows down, so it, it, it's tough to say. But I, I, I we try to to do every four to six weeks. Okay, great. Is there anything that you wanted to discuss today that we didn't touch on? No, I, I think we 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 hit everything, and you know, like like we mentioned, uh, M and A is is starting to heat up, and as we go through, you know, this list, really, we're the last man standing in in, in showing come kind of the most robust economics on 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 that list. So it'll it'll be an exciting year. Yeah, well, M and A got a ton of catalysts that the company's driving themselves. Two resource updates, a PEA by the end of the year. I think it's going to be an exciting fall for you guys. Thanks so much for taking the time, Jason. And thanks to everyone that participated. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to reach out to myself or to Jason. And I'll make sure you get put in touch with the company. Um, yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks a lot, Deb. Thanks for everyone for joining. Cheers. Mm-hmm.